Okay, uh, let me introduce our next presentation. So, our next presentation is uh, from the uh, Stellantis APL uh, Workflow, and the uh, title is uh, Ethernet as a Service for the Software Defined Vehicles Design Objectives and uh, Orientations. So, uh, welcome, uh, Pierre. Uh, please, uh, it's now your time. Great, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm a PhD student at Stellantis, and I'd like to show you a broad overview of the Ethernet ecosystem, going through its technologies, research standards, and uh, we'll see that there are some challenges when it comes to the interaction between all the different components. And so this is why I'd like to introduce a concept that takes inspiration from cloud computing. Uh, we call it Ethernet as a Service, and we'll see how it could help us uh, organize our standardization efforts. So here's a quick agenda. I'll start with an introduction of the future automotive use cases. Uh, we'll see how the hardware and embedded architectures are evolving as a consequence, and really how Ethernet should be designed to fit inside all of this context. Then I'll go over a quick state of the art of what could go inside Ethernet, and uh, we'll see what happens when we try to integrate them into a single architecture. And we'll see that uh, we need some solutions, and we'll define this as a service concept as a possible proposal. And then we'll see how we could implement it and we'll discuss some next steps. Great, so here is where automotive is today. We're seeing a lot of new use cases going from connected services to automated driving, user customization and so on. Uh, and so the black curve really shows that there are a lot of new features and the number of functions is only constantly increasing. And uh, in fact, future vehicles are mainly following two main transformations. The first one being sustainability. Um, we are seeing the appearance of shared vehicles, robo-taxis, uh, connected services, lightweight platforms, micro-mobility, V2X, and so on. Uh, and the second one is, of course, years of experience, um, because future vehicles may very much be seen as smartphones on wheels uh, with user personalization, updates, uh, services, connectivity, and so on. However, um, as you may see from the black curve, it flattens out from time to time uh, because sometimes it's quite difficult to keep up with the rhythm. And this is actually due to the integration complexity, which increases even more when we stay on one fixed architecture. And so this is why we saw the appearance on, of CAN buses in the 90s, uh, which brought back the complexity back down to enable new use cases. And today is the same thing. We're seeing the appearance of centralized or zonal and service-oriented architectures uh, to enable these new use cases for a more dynamic behavior as we saw with the SDN use cases just before. Great, so uh, there is a need for a change in architectures and uh, I'm sure you know that there are two main transformations happening in the automotive. And the first one on the left is the hardware. I'm sure you know that we're having a more zonal approach uh, which decreases cable length, costs and weight. Um, and Ethernet is, of course, one of the main drivers of this uh, because it lets us share one cable for all network flows in the vehicle. However, um, we also notice that the complexity that is reduced from hardware is actually only moving to software. And so I'd like to show a small history of the different evolutions we saw in the architectures, mostly coming from AT, and this will set some context on where Ethernet is headed. So first of all, what we saw was software product lines where the idea was to have independent templates that were developed, and then we mix and match them together to form individual solutions. So this worked uh, uh, for a time, but then it started to be get very complicated with diversity to manage, so it's not really scalable. Then we saw multi-agent systems. The idea was to have independent modules that are uh, developed by independent OEMs or suppliers, um, so this gives a lot, a lot of freedom, but then again, we have some issues considering that uh, each OEM or supplier has to agree on common interfaces and communication technologies. So it can get quite hard also. And so then, now we're seeing SOA, of course. The idea is to have one middleware, which manages both the orchestration of services and communication. And the main idea, of course, is to base uh, ourselves around standards. So once we define standards between services and the middleware, then everything becomes interchangeable. We can switch the implementation of services, middlewares, ECUs, and so on, and uh, we keep it vendor neutral. So it really creates an ecosystem in the automotive industry. 
And then from cloud computing, we saw other architectures which are not really relevant. Uh, we saw uh, smaller and more independent modules, uh, services. We saw also new extremely high performance middlewares, uh, such as event-driven architectures. Uh, but for onboard architectures, we don't really need it today, so I'll pass on that. And so this is why SOA is seen as the next architecture paradigm, and it brings with standards a modular architecture with interchangeable components for a, a SDV ecosystem. Okay, so that's a great objective, but uh, what happens to Ethernet in this context? And uh, actually we'll see that there is one major uh, constraint that we must keep in mind before designing the whole architecture, uh, which was actually pretty well described uh, in the previous presentation. So uh, with these future vehicles, we can see that there are many more services that are going to uh, launch and delaunch dynamically inside the vehicle. And uh, actually, some of, the, some of the services might be more or less dynamic depending on, on their nature. So if I take the example of ADAS functions, uh, they don't change very often. However, they need very safety critical flows uh, that must not be disturbed by other dynamic events inside the same cable. Uh, but then at the same time and in the same cable, you might have user applications, cooperative services for V2X and so on that change every minute, uh, for example, or every hour. Um, and so you must make sure that in the same cable, you are not going to have uh, problems with the different flows happening at the same, same time. And so this is why we must find a way to share one cable with independent configurations, so one for each app, for example, uh, that must coexist and we must be able to change them at different frequencies without disturbing uh, the rest of the flows that are uh, allocated inside the same cable. And so this is really what drives the need for dynamic reconfigurations with SDN, for example. Um, so that's one constraint that we must keep in mind. Okay, well, with that, question is, uh, what kind of architectures, what kind of technologies uh, could help us to meet these constraints? And right before getting into the technologies, I'd like to point out one objective that we would like to fix ourselves, uh, which is to define the whole, art, the whole architecture for Ethernet as a self-contained box, so everything is contained in one box. We define the interfaces between Ethernet and the, the rest of the architecture, and this will let us be completely interchangeable with the rest and be independent. So that's a one goal that we would like to keep in mind when defining the architecture. Okay, with that in mind, I'd like to start with a quick introduction and state of the art of what could go inside Ethernet, and then we'll see what happens when we try to combine them and form an architecture. So I'll start with uh, one of the main domains inside Ethernet, I'm sure you know, which is timing, uh, how to manage diverse flows with different QoS requirements. And so you might have on the left different flows, types of flows that happen inside the same vehicle. Uh, you might have uh, in the same cable, you might have hard real time with low latency, low jitter, all the way up to best effort traffic. And how do you achieve this? Well, you combine uh, on the right a lot of different technologies and possibilities, uh, such as TSN for, how, for real time, I'm sure you know it, uh, which has a lot of different standards. And we can choose some combinations of what we prefer to form a, a final solution. But then when you see that, uh, the first thing you ask yourself is how are you going to combine them and how are you going to configure them to create a coherent configuration for all the different standards at the same time? So that's one question we'll see later. But then for the rest also, you can continue uh, with other techniques or technologies. You could use statistical analysis uh, for soft real time. You can reuse some standards from TSN for traffic generation, uh, traffic um, credit-based shaping, for example. And uh, you can reserve some bandwidth for best effort and so on. With that, uh, we have two conclusions. The first one is that we have a high diversity of choice, which is really good in the ecosystem. It makes everything very flexible and, and adaptive based on our requirements. But then at the same time, it introduces one big challenge, which is the lack of interchangeability. Uh, so the question is, how do you configure everything? And if one day you want to change the technology, how do you do it? How, is it going to be easy to change one technology to another 10 years from now? So that's one question we have to keep in mind. And I'd like to in illustrate this uh, problem with an example right now. So let's take an example, uh, just an illustration. Let's say that three different 
uh, OEMs or suppliers make three different solutions. One might be based on, on uh, time of our shaper, the other on credit-based shaper, and the one with only priorities without TSN, but with high bandwidth. Why not? Just an example as an illustration. And so now, the question is, what happens when, uh, if each supplier develops their solution completely separately, and uh, they don't really, uh, they develop only their proprietary interfaces? Well, what happens, of course, is that nothing will be interchangeable. Um, if you want to change a technology someday, you might have to re-implement everything. And actually, you might even impact the implementation of the whole infrastructure uh, because the data and the requirements representation for each option might be different. So uh, there is a, a, great, uh, a great coupling between all of these different options, and we wish to avoid that. Okay, so this is a problem, of course. Uh, but there are some solutions coming. So if I take the example of TSN, uh, you can see that Yang models are appearing uh, to have a, a technology agnostic uh, view of the requirement. So that's a great thing, a great start. But then uh, when we continue to think about it, uh, there is a problem with other domains. So what happens when you want to combine TSN with SDN or routing, security, energy, and so on? Uh, so you can see that maybe some, uh, one will impact the other. And so that's a question we have, uh, because we still want to keep this goal of interoperability uh, between all the different domains. Um, and so let's continue the example. So we saw TSN. We saw that it might impact other domains. So let's take another one, like routing, um, with the SDN, which is, was very well presented. And so today, there are two main options for uh, routing. The first one is more traditional networking. Uh, where we have independent switches that are made by different suppliers. Each one is managed locally by their own control plane, for example. Uh, and if you want to change something, you have to re reflash the switch, for example. So that's uh, great, but now we're having a more dynamic context, and it's really driving the need for SDN, uh, which is going to bring more dynamic behaviors. And so here, the idea is that each switch is going to have the same API. So there's one API for everyone, every supplier. And then there is one orchestrator that is going to uh, get the statistics for each switch, have a global view, and then decide, decide on local changes uh, depending on what's needed. However, this is still under research. So there, there is some work uh, going on, uh, but it's still under, under evaluation. Um, and so what you can see is, is that uh, TSN, which we saw earlier, might be impacted by the choice you make here. So if you choose traditional networking or SDN, uh, the implementation might change uh, on TSN. And so uh, you have a higher coupling, and we wish to be able to change any technology anytime we want. So that's not really that's difficult. And actually, it's the same thing for all the other topics. So should it be security, energy, firewalls, and so on. And so question again, how do you create a configuration for every domain at the same time, which is coherent, and still be able to change the, the technology you want uh, when you need to change it? And I'll finish this example with one last slide. Uh, you might think that you can manage this uh, through the control plane. So you have control services, and you change based on the one you want. Uh, so that's a good option. But as you can see, again, you have a lot of different control services, a lot of different options. And so, for example, if you want to change TSN for something else, then it's going to impact all the others. And so, again, it's the same problem. Again, the problem is, how do you make everything interact together and still being interchangeable? Okay, so let's recap for a moment. Um, just as, as a summary for now, uh, we saw that there is a really high choice of solutions, which is, of course, a great thing. But then at the same time, each supplier or OEM will change and uh, choose different combinations of technologies. And uh, the risk is that we are going to trap ourselves uh, into making proprietary solutions, and uh, then it will be very difficult to interchange the technologies and evolve from it. And so this is why we are searching for an architecture, a way to organize everything, uh, such that everything stays interchangeable. OK. well. So this is why now I'd like to go uh, take inspiration from other things we see, we've see, we're seeing, such as cloud computing, uh, and we'll see that there are some ways to make everything uh, better. <laughs>
Right before diving in, I'd like to take one last time some, uh, uh, a step back uh, to see that Ethernet is connected to a lot of different uh, technologies, domains, uh, inside the whole architecture. So there is real-time traffic shaping, there is routing, which we saw earlier, but then there is a lot of other things, such as uh, the interaction with virtualization, so real-time containers, virtual machines, and so on. You have to manage the interaction with gateways, external and legacy, and so on, so IP protocols, and, and so on. And so the question is, how are you going to implement Ethernet uh, inside the architecture, which is a middleware, sometimes we call it car OS. Um, and so the question is, how do you make it inside and still be interchangeable uh, with the connection it has with the other components? Sorry. OK, so um, we'd like to find a proposal for this. And so we're taking inspiration from cloud computing. And so first of all, what is the cloud and why is it related to uh, automotive? Because you might think at first that it has nothing to do uh, with automotive. For example, you might say that there are uh, uh, features that are not related to automotive, such as storage, backups, and so on. You might also think that there are features missing, such as the lack of uh, support for heterogeneous environments, real-time functions, safety, and so on. So that's missing. But at the same time, um, if you think about the new uh, dynamic context of SDVs, uh, then you have a lot of common features, such as service dynamic sc service scheduling, uh, dynamic network configuration, uh, redundancy, and so on. And this is why we believe that software-defined vehicles, they could be seen as a sort of a data center on wheels because they have common traits. Both of them are aiming for flexible and instantaneous updates, monitoring, diagnostics, dynamic behaviors, and so on. So both of them have some objectives that are common. And actually, uh, the cloud is heavily, very heavily based on standard interfaces between components. And so this is why we think we could take inspiration with, uh, for it uh, inside the, this new context for automotive. And so just as an example, uh, there's Kubernetes, which is a, a very well-known, one of the main infrastructure management systems. Uh, and so I'll present it later, uh, how we could take some inspiration from it. OK, so how do they do it? Uh, because in the cloud, they have found a solution already. And so now the question is, is it interesting for automotive? Well, the secret ingredient they have is uh, what they call anything as a service. And I'd like to explain it with a small example using pizza. Why not? So let's take pizza as an, as an example. Uh, you might have different ways to make or to take a pizza. For example, you make it at home, you take it at delivery, or you go to a restaurant, for, for example. Well, actually, what you're really choosing when you choose an option is what you don't want to manage. So uh, at home, you choose to do everything. And at the restaurant, everything is made for you. You don't care about, uh, about how the pizza is made, uh, where the soda was bought, and the energy, and so on. You don't care about it. Well, in the cloud, it's uh, actually the same thing. So if you replace the pizza by data centers, it still works. So you can have your own data center and manage everything, so hardware, energy, software. Um, and uh, you can rent someone else's data center, so it's uh, Google Cloud, AWS, Microsoft Azure, and so on. Um, and then you can also use a cloud-based solution that's completely done, so for example, I don't know, Microsoft Teams, for example, uh, is another option for you. Well, actually, how they do this uh, to, to create this choice is that they separate each domain of the architecture into layers, independent layers, and then they define the interfaces between each layer. And then the implementations are completely switchable. So you can switch the dining table for a picnic, for example, and it's still going to work. Uh, you still have the pizza at a picnic. And so it's the same thing uh, in the cloud. And well, using this met methodology, we could actually do the same thing in automotive. Uh, we could separate the architecture into layers, so network, Ethernet, uh, SOA, management, lifecycle, and so on. And so why not do the same? And so here is what it could look like. Um, this time, we are not uh, using the service. We are providing it. So we are providing Ethernet. And uh, this is how it looks like. So you have different layers, and we are responsible for this. And how do you make it work? Well, you need to define standard APIs with the rest of the architectures, 
And once you have that, then everything becomes interchangeable and you can choose whatever you want inside the Ethernet. And so uh, for the case of Ethernet, you have to define an API with the applications uh, so that they can ask for new flows, for example. And on the infrastructure, you also have to do something so that the infrastructure can do self-healing, intrusion, uh, echo mode, and so on. Great, so that's a good objective, but how do you define those APIs? How do you make them? Um, before answering this question, we have to look at, uh, first of all, where Ethernet is connected, um, which will set some context on how do you define the API with the rest of the architecture. And so here, we'd like to propose a way of seeing the overall architecture using this layer uh, representation with different layers. And so I'll present it quickly. Um, on the top, you see that applications uh, are developed independently from the hardware. So you can define requirements such as network flows, uh, virtual environments, and so on, uh, real-time requirements, and so on. And then the entire architecture is going to automatically select uh, where to install it inside the physical architecture in the right ECU. And how, do they, how can we do this? Well, it happens in layers, and I go, I'm going to go from the bottom uh, up. The first layer is hardware virtualization, where you can have virtual machines and containers to install the application in the right ECU. You then have network virtualization, which uh, makes sure that applications don't care uh, what technology and network they're using, so if uh, the packet is going through CAN, network, uh, CAN buses, Ethernet network, they don't care about it. Uh, the network virtualization is going to abstract the complexity. And this can happen with various technologies we saw already. And then there's the brain of the architecture in two layers. The first one is infrastructure, which manages the, uh, the complexity uh, of network and hardware. So it abstracts, uh, hides the complexity and manages it and presents it as a unique environment to SOA. And then finally, SOA is going to orchestrate the services with life cycles, updates, and so on. Well, um, as you can see, Ethernet is of course in the network uh, layer and it's going to interact with both the infrastructure and the virtualization. And so this introduces um, some challenges, such as, for example, how to interact with vir virtual environments, uh, how to uh, respond to QoS changes that are requested by the infrastructure and various dynamic mechanisms to change based on, on what you want. And so the question is, how are we, we going to define uh, this architecture uh, to make it uh, completely interchangeable relative to the rest of the architecture? So that's the question. And there you have it. This is how they do it in the cloud. Uh, this is a picture that comes from Kubernetes and so the main concept they have, the, very, uh, the core concept they have, is this idea of centralized state representation. So the idea is that uh, they have a representation of the entire cluster for them, or vehicle for us, uh, of the architecture, uh, independently from the technologies. So it's completely technology agnostic. And then the other layer uh, components, every component with no exception, is going to talk only with uh, this component here. And so they can write about their state uh, inside the decentralized state. They can read about uh, other people's, other components' states. And they can also request for changes uh, for a new state that they would like to see, but they, they're not responsible for. Um, and so this is what, uh, how it happens. And so with various different components, uh, you, at the end, you get a very plug and play interchangeable uh, system uh, in the cloud. So now, for example, you can, there is a very large ecosystem in the cloud where you can change one implementation uh, using different technologies based on what you want, and it's still going to work and be interchangeable. So the first step is to define uh, this uh, technology agnostic uh, representation, and then once you have that, you can define the interfaces with the rest of the domains. So this is how they do it, step by step. And finally, uh, just to finish quickly, um, here's a, a representation of how we could implement it uh, inside a vehicle, just a general uh, broad vision. Uh, so let me start uh, with the hardware. So you have different ECUs. Uh, you may use TSN, SDN, uh, virtual machine managers, and so on. 
So just an, as an example, you don't need to use all of them. It depends on your requirements for each ECU. Uh, but then the idea is that each component is going to listen to uh, some master somewhere in the in the ECU. So it could be centralized, it could be distributed. I'm just going to take the example as centralized for simplification here. And so then what happens is that you have other components. So here you can manage uh, the network inside each OS, for example. Uh, and again, they're going to listen to orders that come from the master. And so you have the central storage, the state storage, uh, which is the main idea inside all of this context. And so they are actually reading and writing inside the storage before anything else. So this is how they, work, they do it. And they're going to translate the technology agnostic uh, state that is here and uh, progressively uh, progress towards the desired state by translating uh, what they see into the correct uh, technology and the correct implementation that is happening inside each, uh, each uh, module. And then at the end, you have various control services uh, that can happen. So for example, you have the app scheduler and it's going to uh, have, for example, plugins for SDN, TSN, depending on what you need. And so they are going to read uh, the state, write with different changes, and uh, this is how they do it. So everyone talks only through this. And this is uh, how it could work to make everything interchangeable. And of course, standards will be needed across all this to make uh, different suppliers work together toward the central storage. Great, so uh, I'd like to finish up with a quick discussion. Um, what we saw is that interchangeability is what the industry really needs to create a global ecosystem uh, inside the entire uh, industry. Uh, and to do this, we need a common language that can be made from standardized APIs between the different domains and implementations. So routing, security, and then all the way up to Ethernet with the rest of the architecture. And to do this, we propose this as a service concept and bring it to automotive uh, to organize the way we define our standards. And so um, to continue on this route, we propose to discuss with the rest of the, uh, the, the OEMs and suppliers uh, how do we de define the application requirements uh, to then define the re state representation? So how are, what are we going to write inside and make sure that it's standardized? And once you have this, then you can uh, define the APIs and you can go over what you want. So there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, as a takeaway, the idea is really to have a, uh, discuss how we're going to have a common data representation for Ethernet requirements which is going to let us define the state storage, then the APIs, and then the implementations. And so with this, I hope that in the entire industry, we won't have this kind of awkward handshakes uh, into the industry anymore with this kind of uh, organization we have. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank, thank you. Oh, thanks, Pierre, uh, for your uh, well-summarized uh, information and uh, what we understand what should we uh, consider? So, any? Uh, op let, let me uh, open questions for audience. Okay, please. Yes, I have two questions. Uh, would you please show us the uh, orchestra orchestration of the a slide of the orchestration you showed us? Uh, the uh, the concept of that orchestration. Uh, probably you need a conductor. Somebody should control everything. So. Is that the same concept of the uh, JASPA MOM, master of master? Is that the...? Uh, it kind of looks like it. Uh, there, are, there may be different ways of doing it. Um, one, the way they do it on uh, the cloud is that they have uh, one server that manages the APIs with the different components. And so it only manages who talks when. And so this, this is how they do it. So it kind of looks like the MOM uh, uh, component we saw. But then the, there is a second way of doing it, is that uh, we have independent uh, control services that each are going to, to talk separately to the desired storage, and this is how they do it. So they are only responsible for their area, uh, and then once they have this, uh, each one is only going to set the desired state for other components, read what they need for themselves, do the changes, write the new, uh, uh, the new uh, state, and so on. So this is, they work independently, but uh, you have kind of an event-driven event way of managing the synchronization between them. They have to know each other. <laughs> okay. Yeah, actually, uh, if you have 
If you design slots, for, uh, for example, one which is resp responsible for uh, Ethernet network, uh, then you can switch the implementation, but still you keep the same API. And so uh, if you, others are going to need to know other domains, uh, but they don't really need to know the implementation for each of them. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't talk, uh, say my name. I, I'm um, Osami Wada from Kyoto University, sorry. Thank you. And the second question is just a short question. Uh, uh, on the software, uh, like API, you, you can use that kind of way, but as for the hardware, probably the uh, kind of uh, the same platform or something like that will be needed for testability or the interchangeability. I'm sorry, some kind of POC, you mean? Yeah, some kind of uh, the same platform, same hardware structure oh. or something like that. Um, if, if the platform, uh, if we consider different platforms, then it's going to be very difficult to connect each by each. Yeah, um, that, that's for sure true at some point. Uh, however, we think that it could be possible to make things interchange implementations interchangeable. So if you have one ECU with different hardware, uh, I mean two ECUs with different hardware, uh, you implement the TSN solution or the network solution differently for each, and then you define one API for both of them, and they are going to connect to the central storage uh, and so you can switch the implementations. So some layer you can, how can I say, use the same uh, language to connect together. Yeah, so once you have the central state, then the APIs, then you can switch the implementations as long as you keep the same APIs. Okay, okay thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, move to uh, coffee break. So uh, any other questions? Uh, Maybe we can accept only one question. Nothing? Okay, oh, so, so thank you for, uh, thank you, Bill, for your presentation. Thank you.